they're not kidding when they talk about the religious landscape could really have an impact on our election coming up this year. There's three things that they're telling us to watch for in trends, and that's people using the end time rhetoric, divine mandate, white supremacy and Christian nationalism often go hand to hand. Here you can see there's people actually posing with signs about white supremacy, and it's quite frightening. Birth control. This is critical to all of us right now. It's not just that. They're focusing on anti-discrimination laws, attacking gay rights, and the First Amendment for all of us. The IVF ruling this week, on the last week that everyone heard about in Alabama, the good news is Florida withdrew their bill this morning that they were going to vote on for personhood and decided to kind of keep it quiet for now because of the backlash from Alabama. But this article from The Nation, the part that scared me the most is it says, don't expect the Supreme Court to come to the rescue here. Bucks County Beacon, Cyril, the editor, is one of our guests tonight, but this great article was about book bans and who's really behind this. It's not just our schools, it's our public libraries. They're coming for everything, including the environment. They already have plans in place as part of Project 2025 that when they get a Republican in there and if we allow it to happen, they are focused on already rolling back the EPA. So there's a lot on the line for all of us, right? great speakers for you tonight. We have um, Catherine, can't get over. We have Catherine Stewart here, whose book is The Power Worshippers, and she has another book getting ready to come out. She's done a dive deeper than most of us will ever do into this. She will be speaking tonight. We also have three amazing journalists that when I dove down the rabbit hole, like Alice in Wonderland, as I got interested in this, it was these journalists who got the attention from me. On, I refuse to call it X, so I still call it Twitter. I started following them on Twitter and they were reporting about things happening here in Pennsylvania. Then I started following at the national level and they have started a group called Crow, which we will talk more about later. And they are going to speak tonight. But to get us kicked off tonight, we have the amazing Reverend Carla. Um, she'll be on screen in a second. I learned about the term deconstructing from her. I never heard that used with faith before until I had a chance to speak with her. She is an ordained interfaith minister and spiritual mentor. She shines a light on the path for those who are struggling with religious trauma or those who are questioning just their religious heritage. She primarily does her teaching online and she explores topics from deconstructing Christianity, healing the religious trauma, spiritual but not religious path and the dangers of Christian nationalism. Reverend Carl is a passionate advocate for social justice and equity. She's also teaching everybody about spirituality is more a reflection of our kindness and compassion than a focus on the afterlife. And that really resonated with me. She's also the founder of the Animal Welfare Organization in Indiana. And her first book, Deconstructing, Leaving the Church, Finding Faith, will be published later this year. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over and welcome Reverend Carla. Hello, everyone. Oh my goodness, it's such, it is an absolute honor to be here. I am a little starstruck by the people here, but also the amazing work that Red, White, and Blue is doing. Y'all are, y'all are amazing. Um, I'm going to get going right at the beginning because I know that I, um, there's going to be some amazing conversations happening. So I want to ask you a question because I think a lot of you have a similar journey as I have had. Um, I want to ask you a question. How many of you grew up singing the song Onward Christian Soldiers? That song was near and dear to me for many, many years. And at the time, I had no idea that that song was actually integral to an indoctrination that was happening with my faith. I just didn't know it. Now, I want to pause there really, really quickly to tell you that singing that song does not make you a Christian nationalist. There's nothing about your faith that requires you to leave it in order for you to take a stance against Christian nationalism. The first thing that I'm always asked about uh, when I talk about the, the concerns about Christian nationalism is, do I have to denounce some part of my faith or do I have to deconstruct? No, I do not proselytize deconstructing. What I do, is I talk about the activism that each of us should become informed and educated about so that we can speak against the dangers of Christian nationalism. 
What I also do is call out the type of Christian belief that says that your framework of Christianity is the only true religion, and therefore that based on those beliefs, I have the right to oppress others or force them to live under that framework because that is religious oppression. And that is the precept of Christian nationalism. So anti-Christian nationalism is not being anti-Christian. But a very simple definition of uh, Christian nationalism is Christianity integrated into our government and societal framework. But I also love the definition that's in this document that you can go download right now. It's called All of Us Organizing to Counter White Christian Nationalism and Build a Pro-Democracy Society. Because there are many Christians that are working against Christian nationalism. You can find this at, let me get, make sure I get the website up. Christians, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. It's at organizingallofus.org, organizingallofus.org. It's worth the read. So please go download that. Um, Catherine, the amazing Catherine Stewart is also uh, recognized in this um, document. But what it says is, White Christian nationalism is characterized by a set of beliefs that point to a particular interpretation of the founding and future identity of the United States. Because even though we are calling this Christian nationalism, we must accept the fact that this is rooted in white supremacy. And therefore, many of us who grew up in, in parts of this, this Christianity received some of that indoctrination. And so when you're sitting here at this intersection trying to figure out this, this conflict that you may be feeling and understanding that, that recognizing that there's things that you may have to deconstruct from doesn't me make you a bad person. But it's very important that you intend these kinds of things because that's how we become empowered and educated and we learn to release those things that no longer serve our highest good. But that integration and even the romanticization of military and war within certain segments of fundamentalist Christianity, and when we say fundamentalist or evangelical, we're talking about the type of Christianity where you're looking at real, literal, rigid dogma that is just, in, in their minds, inarguable. You have to believe it this way or you aren't part of their denomination. And that leads to that framework for Christian nationalism. So you might have heard things about spiritual warfare or sang songs about army of God or the battle for the souls, or even we taught the children songs like I'm in the Lord's army because I was raised primarily Southern Baptist and then navigated through evangelical Christianity and into some progressive Christianity before I finally realized that my spirituality was just not going to be contained inside one religion. And it took me almost 50 years to figure that out. But this this is this this valorizes the idea of fighting for one's faith. And then that starts to blur the lines between spirituality and physical combat. And once you start to see those kinds of intersections, then you start to understand how deeply integrating Christian Christian nationalism is into some of these denominational beliefs. And that's why it's important to understand that Christian nationalism is also, and, and trust me, I'm going to do a very high flyover any one of these topics, as I'm sure this esteemed panel understands too, you could go into a two hour conversation. So I'm sure you're going to have lots of questions about this, but this really is a high flyover just to give you the high talking points at this time. But you can't talk about Christian nationalism without talking about patriarchy. And because once again, there's this intersection with Christian na nationalists with the, what is the Republican party now, and that's indisputable because you, whenever you have Mike Johnson getting up and saying that he is ordained by God to be the Moses of his time, then he is definitely invoking his evangelical fundamentalist Christian faith. And those are cues for people to not only 
support him, but be compliant and submissive, even if they have concerns, because that is the indoctrination of that faith. We don't care if you disagree as long as you're silent and you won't do anything to dispute us because you understand that I'm telling you I'm ordained by God, so you need to remain silent. When you saw the January 6th insurrectionist praying, it's the same kind of indoctrination. Or when Mike Pence gets up to say that, oh no, we all have it wrong. What religious freedom actually is, is I as a Christian get to tell you as a non-Christian or other Christians who don't believe as I do, that I get to tell you how you're going to live your life. I'm going to tell you how we're going to run government. I'm going to tell you what how we're going to teach the children. I'm going to tell you we're going to bring the Christian prayer back to school because I have the right. That's the definition of relig religious freedom, which, which it absolutely isn't. But this conflation of what facts are is very much part of what Christian, Christian nationalists do so they are they they integrate into the patriarchal system because what this system does is protect the white christian man so when you look at the mike johnsons and the mike pence they are at the very top of the pinnacle that also you see how that's integrated into our demo democratic system because yes democracy is our beloved democracy but it is rooted in patriarchy so it was very easy to have those two things intertwined. And that is why they are working to protect that system and why it was so easy to do it through the system of government that we have, which easily does not represent right now the white Christian man is completely uh, skews the numbers that are in the House and the Senate is not very represent representative of actually what the, the demographics of the United States are. And so once again, when you look at the, the data and how things are changing, even the number of people who identify as Christian, any, any one of those, that, those data points that change is an existential threat to the white Christian man who sees himself at the pinnacle of power and wants to continue to protect that. Now, this is where oftentimes I will get accused of being uh, anti-man. Well, I just hate men. That's not true. And being anti-patriarchy, being anti-Christian nationalist is not anti-masculinity. It's anti-toxic masculinity. And anything that I talked about with Mike Johnson or Mike Pence or any one of those, you can look at what toxic mas masculinity does to people when it weaponizes, stigmatizes, oppresses, belittles, and promotes very unhealthy um, ideals about how the rest of society should submit to the white Christian man. So this structure, everyone is at risk of losing some, some part of their rights, and that is what they are trying to protect. The one thing that we also want to talk about when we're, when we're looking at Christian nationalism is this type of Christianity has no problems of using any means whatsoever, including deception, manipulation, and even corruption for their end goal, as long as they can do it and, and do it in the name of the Lord. You will often hear Greg Locke invoking that kind of thing in the name of God, in the name of, Lord, of the Lord, because as the belief system is, I am saved, I'm always saved, and those who are unsaved are of the world, they're going to be destroyed anyway. So anything that I do that can hasten the return of Jesus is justified because everything in this world is going to be destroyed anyway, and then it's going to be restored and Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years. Now, there are very much people inside the Christian nationalist movement who believe that. But then there are us also people who are aligned with that, that belief just because of the benefit of aligning with that framework, because it prioritizes the white men remaining in power. So I was asked if I was going to talk, I got three minutes, I was asked if I was going to talk about uh, Project 2025, and I just, I know several of the people are going to talk about that tonight. 
And I think over the last couple of days, you are starting to see some of the culmination of what is planned in Project 2025. I took a, a quick peek at the website because I decided that concentrating on Project 2025 to the point that we're terrified by it is actually going to distract us from what is happening right now. And when you see things like what happened in Alabama, then you realize what a threat to our democracy and to our rights is happening right now. So I would prefer that you focus on what is happening with the Seven Mountain Mandate, because that very much lines with what's happening inside Christian nationalism. And I know several of the speakers are going to talk about that tonight, because you can then look at the framework and how those seven areas of, of culture and society and belief are all being influenced by Christian nationalists. I want to close by saying that what I talked about when uh, Sherry gave my bio and I talked about, I do believe that our intersection of our spirituality is uh, how we show up in the world and that we leave this place better than we found it. And that's our legacy. Because when we hyper-focus on that salvation, then we miss the goodness that we can do here. And oftentimes focusing on that is, is benefits some of that fundamentalist belief. So I want to encourage you to look at some of what you're doing here and, and learning and unlearning some of the things that may um, be part of your own religious heritage, that this is what sacred activism looks like. It also will help you heal from the parts of patriarchal, because each one of us have been harmed by some kind of patriarchal belief. It doesn't just empower men, it harms anybody that's in that structure, including the men. So I encourage you to continue to walk towards that sacred activism. And it's important, it's very imperative that children, Christians, unchurched, atheists, agnostics, everyone work together to defend our democracy. Because if you're struggling right now with how you can help, understand that your faith can actually be the catalyst that helps protect our democ democracy and help and protect all of humanity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm actually clapping here. That was amazing. And I was trying to watch the chat as you were going. And what I saw was so many connections being made, people identifying with what you were saying, some people expressing fear. Please don't be afraid. We're here to talk about it so that we can learn about it and tell others about it and take control so that we don't have to be afraid. But I loved seeing connections of some of you connecting with other people, realizing you're living in the same town, the same area, that you're not alone out there. So please connect with each other, trade names, numbers, whatever. We love bringing you together. Um, I saw somebody else talk about the Good News Club, which made me really happy as we transition now into presenting Catherine Stewart. Her latest book, which she'll have behind her, but I also have here with me, is The Power, Wor Power Worshippers. And it has cost me several nights of sleep as I continue to jump into more rabbit holes as I went chapter to chapter of her book. So check it out. It's the Inside Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. It was awarded first place for excellence in the nonfiction books of Religion News Association, as well as the Morris D. Forkosh Award. She writes for the New York Times Opinion, The New Republic, others, has been on CNN, MSNBC, NPR. The Power Worshipper is inspired by, has inspired the documentary film you've probably all been hearing about, God and Country, that Rob Reiner has produced. It's based on Catherine's book. When I connected with her through Twitter, I thought, let's see if she actually will respond. And within an hour, she responded, and we ended up scheduling a phone call, which led to us doing this whole event tonight. And I'm really excited that she has another book coming out in January of 2025, also will be published by Bloomsbury. And we're going to be sending out an email follow-up to this session today, giving you all the link to the recording of the event tonight, as well as how to connect with all of our presenters on social media. And I know there's a lot of questions. Our events are normally an hour long. Tonight, all of our presenters have graciously agreed to stay on. After 8.30, we're gonna host an after party for Q&A. So sit back, grab a drink, relax. I'd like to now turn it over so we can all learn from Catherine. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to Red, White, and Wine, and Blue, to everybody here for making time for this event. Uh, thank you, Sherry, for that really terrific introduction. Um, 
you know, the film gun country might not be as funny as this is Spinal Tap, but I hope you guys all go see it anyway. It really shows that Christian nationalism is not just an ideology, a set of ideas, uh, but also uh, an organizational apparatus, a well-funded, leadership-driven, organization-driven political machine. Um, uh, that movement is really very good at mobilizing people, not just those who explicitly identify themselves as Christian nationalists, but also many fellow travelers, people who lend their support to the movement in other ways. And I think we uh, misunderstand the extent to which this movement is determined to undermine the democratic process. Um, you know, but I wanna start with IVF, right? Cause we're all reading about this in the news. Uh, Alabama Supreme Court Justice Tom Parker, who has often invoked his religion in his decisions, wrote that frozen embryos, quote, cannot be wrongfully destroyed without incurring the wrath of a holy God. He argued that Alabama law is based rightly on theology. He and the other justices in this eight to one majority said that life begins at conception, the moment of conception, and therefore these frozen embryos are protected under the law. This just shows that this movement, the Christian nationalist movement, which now basically calls the shots in today's Republican party, a sort of guardrails have, have fallen off, um, they're not stopping with abortion. This attack on IVF is just one piece of a much larger pie, and it should obliterate any illusion that the movement will be satisfied uh, with one medical procedure or X number of weak abortion bans. They're going after state control of everything connected with sex and reproduction. By the same logic that led to this decision in Alabama, they're going to come after some of the most popular and effective forms of birth control. You know, I go to these gatherings, they refer to birth control pills sometimes as chemical abortion. They're going after the ability of pregnant women to travel out of state. We've already seen some of these like fugitive women laws where pregnant women are not allowed to travel to other counties or states in order to obtain uh, medical care. They're going after the ability of doctors to advise their patients. They're going after the ability of police officers to counsel, uh, counsel victims of assault and rape. They're going after the ability of friends and family members to assist their loved ones in need. And as I will explain in the speech, that agenda is really just one part of a much larger assault on democracy, our freedoms, and uh, our, and the institutions of our of our democracy as well. Now, before I get into that, I want to note that, you know, as Sherry mentioned, the Republican Party still depends on the votes of a significant number of people who are not on board with this anti-IVF extremism. And it's worth noting, uh, it's not uh, uh, insignificant, that the average IVF user uh, is disproportionately older and wealthier than the typical patient. And many of these folks are Republican Party donors, and they're completely outraged. As a consequence, Republican politicians are now desperately trying to make a carve out for IVF, which is really ironic because many of them supported bills that would have made IVF very dis difficult or impossible in practice. But notice what they're not making a carve out for, birth control pills, uh, IUDs, which also prevent implantation by that same logic, also constitutes abortion. And in states with extreme bans, they are not carving out exceptions for 12-year-old rape victims. Um, so it really shows who they have sympathy for and who they don't. In fact, if you look at that Project 2025 document, a 900-page document and blueprint for a second Trump term, which was put together by the Heritage Foundation, Sherry, which you described earlier, it was also uh, other contributors include religious right leaders uh, or leaders of religious right organizations and far right think tanks. So in that uh, Project 2025, you have this um, pro-life ideology, which bans all those things. It's a it's a unifying feature of it. It, it seems to be like one of the, the unifying principles of this Project 2025. Over and over, they talk about how important it is to be pro-life in the way that they define it. So going back to uh, Supreme Court Justice in Alabama, Tom Parker, it's important to note that his extremism does not come out of left field. It's part and parcel 
of the Christian nationalist movement. In fact, Judge Parker subscribes to something called the Seven Mountains Mandate. Um, it's or Seven Mountains Dominionism. It's basically, in short, the idea that conservative Christians should dominate all the key areas of government and society. This is a radically anti-democratic ideology. It was once relegated to the fringes of the religious right, I would say, uh, in an earlier time, but it's fast becoming mainstreamed within the movement. Um, I, I believe that one of our subsequent speakers, Kira, uh, might be delving into this uh, more a little later. But in the meantime, these types of rulings are causing untold amounts of damage on the ground. Now, let me offer a few short anecdotes. Anya Cook was 16 weeks pregnant when her water broke prematurely. She rushed to the hospital, was diagnosed with pre-viability, preterm membrane rupture. This condition can be life-threatening. You can lose your life over it, and it results in miscarriage or neonatal death nine out of 10 times. So her, um, her uh, this fetus was doomed. In most places in the developed world, doctors would have advised her to terminate the pregnancy immediately to preserve her health. And that's what Cook wanted to do. But Cook made the mistake of living in Florida where abortion was banned at that stage. The medical staff at the hospital was afraid of running afoul of the law. So they gave her antibiotics and they said they would pray for her and they sent her home. And the next day, Cook delivered her stillborn fetus whom she had planned to call Bunny in the bathroom at her workplace. She began to hemorrhage very badly. She lost half of her blood before receiving life-saving treatment. She was you know, rushed to the hospital got treatment, she'd lost half her blood. She is so lucky to have survived. Now, I wanna tell you about the kinds of debates going on at Crisis Magazine. It's one of the most prominent ultra-conservative Catholic publications. They claim to care a lot about women, but they wanna make sure that we're in our place. In the context of debate over women's rights, the editor-in-chief of the magazine, a guy named Michael Warren Davis, summed up the thinking well. He said, 100 years later, any sober and dispassionate mind must conclude that giving ladies the right to vote was the single greatest catastrophe in the history of our storied republic. Now, I want to suggest to you, and there is a very deep connection between these two seemingly different events, the needless suffering of a woman in Florida and the anti-woman politics of Crisis Magazine and its fellow travelers in America's supposedly conservative movement. Depriving women of rights isn't just a consequence of anti-abortion politics. It is the point of the exercise. And this, this is the other main point of my talk today. It isn't just about women's rights. It's also a religious liberty issue and an issue that should concern all who care about the preservation of our democracy and its institutions. Too often supporters of reproductive choice frame the anti-abortion movement in narrow terms. We think that this is just about one issue of fetal development or that the only people whose rights are at stake are women who are seeking to terminate their pregnancies. But abortion has never just been about abortion. It was never just an isolated policy preference. In fact, it's one piece of a radical movement that is working toward comprehensive transformation and indeed destruction of our democracy, we need to understand it as such and talk about it as such. So I wanna talk a little bit, tell you a little bit about how we can broaden our understanding of the anti-abortion movement. The first point to understand is the one that the story of Anya Cook illustrates very well. You cannot take the rights away from those who are seeking abortions without taking away the rights of all who get pregnant, whether they're seeking abortions or not. Anti-abortion law kills mothers, and it kills mothers who want nothing more than to have a baby called Bunny. I'm gonna tell you something, I'm probably gonna cry and I apologize. I'm gonna try and get through this without crying. I know this to be a fact first uh, firsthand because in 2003, I was denied treatment at a Catholic hospital when I was experiencing miscarriage for a pregnancy that my husband and I very much wanted to carry to term. And I too lost 40% of my blood and very nearly died before receiving the abortion that saved my life, all to satisfy the anti-abortion policies of that Catholic hospital. And I am like Anya Cook, 
very, very lucky to be alive today. But there are so many stories that are so much worse than mine. The people who are harmed the most are not here to tell us their stories. Given that as many as one in four pregnancies ends in miscarriage and frequently involve complications, we're seeing some alarming trends in maternal health, particularly among women, women of color. America's maternal mortality rate is startlingly high among nations in the developed world. We're like, you know, outperforming every other rich country in maternal mortality. And these uh, figures, the numbers are rising sharply. It's really astonishing. Black women are nearly three times as likely to die from a pregnancy-related cause as white women. All, they're already at the risk of suffering from racial disparities in healthcare, but they also disproportionately receive reproductive health care restrictions at Catholic hospitals or in red states. But the loss of rights goes even further. You cannot take away the rights of pregnant women without taking the rights of all girls and women, because what you're doing is you're marking out half the population as being members of a lower caste whose bodies are, unlike those of men, property of the state. You're designating that half of humanity for a distinct and subservient role. And this has knock-on effects in every aspect of society. It shows up in lower pay, in widespread workplace discrimination, and in media and cultural depictions of women as subordinate. When you have a subclass of women with no control over the most fundamental freedoms, it impacts how all women are perceived and treated. It's no surprise then that this attack comes out of a movement steeped in patriarchy, as Rev. Carla mentioned, and misogyny, the same movement that brought us into abortion politics, is also a world where the idea of male headship is mainstream and women's equality is cast as one of the greatest threats to human civilization. Large and influential religious organizations and parachurch networks, those are like um, churches that are all connected together um, but they like they have the same theology, but they're planted in different places. Say so these networks often tell women that they should be subservient to their husbands, and they can't hold leadership roles at church, even while those same organizations have tolerated and covered up for abusers in their midst. There are a lot of a lot of right wing think tanks that are sort of getting in on the on the uh, the action. One of them is called the Claremont Institute. It's a, a, a very powerful organization. It's a supposed intellectual nerve center of modern conservatism, um, so-called experts at, uh, who are affiliated with, with Claremont say that the principle of women's equality is, quote, pernicious and a threat to the country. Um, numer some of them speak of women in terms that I would not repeat here or in any form. Numerous individuals associated with Claremont, by the way, have contributed chapters to that Project 2025 document, that blueprint for a second Trump administration. We're also hearing more about revoking women's voting rights through something called household voting from Trump allies like Laura Loomer and Nick Fuentes, from far-right far politicians and advocates of biblical patriarchy, and the anti-abortion leaders like Abby Johnson who has said about voting, she said, in a godly home, the husband would get the final say. Abby Johnson, by the way, was invited to speak at the Republican National Convention. In a way, we should thank her. She's merely saying the quiet part out loud, isn't she? In my research, I've spent a lot of time at anti-abortion gatherings, such as the National Pro-Life Summit, the annual March for Life, a lot of the attendees are actually women, it has to be noted. And they claim, some of them claim to be adopting this stance from an explicitly feminist position. Some people say, well, how can this movement be anti-woman if so many of its most active proponents are women? But here's the thing, patriarchy is a system that promises rewards to women who toe the line and submit, even as it marginalizes those who fail to conform. Some women like, listen, a great number have been successfully indoctrinated in the theology and politics of the anti-abortion movement. Some would rather have the security or approval that comes from conforming to patriarchy's most exact, exacting demands. They think this is my only chance of, of um, stability and security in a complicated life. Um, some hope to gain personal power and status by leading other women into submission. 
and of course many are anti-abortion until the moment that they or their their daughter needs one at which point they suddenly find reasons to make a personal exemption so what is the root cause of this attack on women's rights i want to suggest that hard times promote fear and distrust the great enemies of reason hard times also produce corrupt leaders who are eager to exploit that fear. They do it through promoting disinformation and propaganda. That's how they consolidate their power. And they target vulnerable groups for scapegoating. At right wing and Christian nationalist conferences and gatherings, the fear is broadcast at ear splitting volumes. Our present world, they say, is one of great horror and degeneracy. There's this deep fear of modernity. They say America's on the precipice. We're careening toward a socialist revolution, anarchy, and chaos, and are the, under the thumb of the most despicable human beings imaginable, namely Democrats who are referred to as the enemy, communists, uh, satanic, uh, agents of evil, demonic, what have you. Um, gender and sexuality always appear to be the source of the greatest anxieties, but often they're just like those shiny baubles that serve as a distraction for, from movement leaders and funders' pursuits of a range of broadly unpopular policies, including, I must add, economic policies that make it so much harder for so many American families to succeed, policies that defund and weaken public education, that, um, uh, that uh, limit the rights of the workforce and, and undermine the rights of the for workforce and attacks on voting rights that disproportionately affect people of color and others in democratic leaning districts. With the mounting attacks on women's reproductive rights, some people wonder if we're heading into a sort of handmaid's tale scenario, but we don't need to imagine exotic threats because the world already offers plenty of examples of what we could end up with here. Um, let's consider, let's start with Vladimir Putin's Russia, which uh, much of the uh, GOP seems to have a little bit of a affection for. It's theocratic, in a certain fake sense, that is, it's a regime that endorses a particular religion and attempts to impose that religion and its homophobic and patriarchal values on society, but it's more accurately described as a cronyist kleptocracy with strong militaristic features and absolute suppression of political opposition and free speech. I mean, there are other models. Let's look at Turkey, Erdogan, who arrested and jailed thousands of journalists and ap academics. Let's look at Viktor Orban in Hungary, who has criminalized basic democratic activities, um, attacked the independence of the courts and implemented strict media controls, and who, by the way, much of the American right explicitly celebrates. So of course there are nuances specific to these different countries. What we would get here would be very distinctly American, but we can lose our freedoms in so many different ways. In fact, we would already, uh, we've already started to do so. Uh, leaders of the anti-abortion movement are among those in this larger movement attacking democracy directly. They're working with Republican politicians to entrench minority rule in state legislatures. They've been working overtime to corrupt the judiciary. They're committed to delegitimizing any and all democratic institutions that fail to impose their radical agenda to government power. Um, Leonard Leo, just very quickly, I want to talk as a leader of the Federal Society, one of the movement's most powerful legal organizations, said explicitly that the right would never win the culture wars at the ballot box. The, only, the, the His positions were just way too unpopular, and he knew it. Um, the only option, he declared, is to use big money to stack the judiciary and uh, get the rulings he wants through the courts. Capture the courts, you can get the society. And he succeeded with the Supreme Court. Um, and the effect of this has frankly been to corrupt and delegitimize one of our three branches of democratic government. Um, well, you know, I don't know how much time I have left, but I think that we have to remember, as Rev. Carla said, there are other religious and humanistic uh, convictions that are no less deserving of equal respect under law. Our country was pluralistic from the, the start. Um, the, the, the constitutional principle of church-state separation has the best piece of real estate in our constitution. It's the very first clause of our very first amendment, and we really need to safeguard it. Um, 
uh, and, uh, and, and safeguard uh, our democracy, its institutions, and, and, and see that the values of empathy, equality, and human dignity are, are worth defending. I wanna wrap this up by talking briefly about solutions and strategies. It should be clear now that this movement will not be placated if we trade away some of our reproductive rights. So my first suggestion is that we need to get out from a defensive crouch, standing up for the rights of women to not have our bodies turned over to the state for forced breeding isn't something that we need to apologize for or downplay. It's something that is valuable in its own right. Second, we need to invest in organizing. This is what the religious right has done. This is what the Christian nationalist movement has done. They have this deep, deeply networked infrastructure and, um, and, and there are things that we can do as individuals, of course, such as vote and encourage others to vote. But there are things we can only really achieve or can achieve better when we join together, which is why I'm so excited and encouraged by organizations such as Red Wine and Blue. Um, I have argued that hard times produce bad ideas, but here I want to underscore my source of hope. Hard times just ask more from those of us who would promote good ideas. The idea of human rights, that all people respect and deserve dignity um, uh, under the law, the, the idea of government of, by, and for the people. These are all really good ideas. They're American ideals. They belong to all of us, and we all need to work toward them. Build your school community. Get involved in local governance. If you belong to a church or a house of worship, work to bring your fellows to the side of justice and democracy. Find out who is committed to protecting the vote and work with them or get involved in voter registration and engagement initiatives or education initiatives. Reach out to those who feel politically disenfranchised. There are a lot of them. In our country, 40 to 50% per of people don't turn out to vote. We need to reach them. We need to tell them that democracy matters. We need to tell them that the Republic is theirs if they can keep it. Thank you so much. And now I look forward to hearing from the rest of you. More applause. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I've loved reading your book and speaking to you on the phone. And tonight you even took it to another level. So thank you so much. Um, next up, we do have Jenny. Kira, unfortunately, we're having technical issues. So she's not going to be able to join us tonight. She was going to touch on dominionism, um, the rhetoric that's used there and groups to watch. So Jenny, if you're able to add anything on that, that would be great. And when I send the email out as a wrap up of the event, we will list all of the Jenny's list of groups to watch because they're in your neighborhoods. They're in your local schools and churches using secular names so that it doesn't appear that they are what they actually are. So we will send you that list. But now I'd love to introduce Jenny. Jenny Cohn is a political writer. Her work focuses on Christian nationalism as well as right-wing extremism election security, which is so hot, and disinformation. She graduated from the University of California at Los Angeles and also the Hastings College of Law. Uh, you practiced for 20 years, I believe, right? And she was a partner at Nielsen, Haley, Abbott in Marin County, California. Then she began to write about election security and right-wing extremism back in 2017. Now has a, a column here with the Bucks County Beacon, which is fantastic. It's an independent media site. Here in Pennsylvania, and Cyril will be speaking next. But in addition to the Beacon, Jenny also has articles that have been in the New York Review of Books, Who, What, Why, The Independent, TYT Investigates, and Brad Bond. So Jenny, thank you for all the work. Again, we'll be sending you a list of how to follow her on Twitter because just in the last few days, she's been on fire. So Jenny, welcome. Go ahead and take the floor. And you're on mute right now, so. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to Red Wine and Blue for having me. And um, I've really enjoyed the talk so far. So I wanted to focus, first of all, on um, the threat that I see to birth control and IVF above and beyond the Alabama Supreme Court's decision. And I've been posting about this quite a bit on my on Twitter X um, because I don't think it's received enough attention. And it has to do with Project 2025, which the previous panelists have already touched on a bit. Um, so one of the main goals of Project 2025 is to take over 
the federal government. Um, in many cases, they seek to dismantle federal agencies. Some of the agencies they may keep, but they want to run them themselves. And by they, I mean the Heritage Foundation, which is the lead organizer of Project 2025, and the 100 or so nonprofits and think tanks that are also tend to be Christian right organizations that have joined on as official partners to Project 2025. And you can find all of those listed, by the way, on the Project 2025 website. It lists all the people who've joined on. So they want to take over these agencies. And according to the president of Heritage Foundation, who is a Catholic fundamentalist named Kevin Roberts, um, they're not going to tell everyone. They're not going to they're not going to share everything they plan to do with, with the left. So although they have released a book which has a lot of information in it about their plans, some of those some of those plans they're holding back. And where this it, it occurred to me somewhere along the way that if they take over the Health and Human Services Department, which they certainly want to do, which includes the Food and Drug Administration, which is responsible for um, approving drugs and withdrawing approval of drugs, then they could, in effect, without even having to go to the courts, effectively eliminate from the marketplace not only the abortion pill, which they do talk about expressly in their Project 2025 handbook, that they want that taken off the market. They could go beyond what they're saying expressly and also target hormonal birth control, which we've seen them increasingly target as um, the, the Christian right and their influencers target as cancer, as dangerous, um, bad for society because it enabled the sexual revolution and let women go outside the home. We're seeing a lot of that messaging. So they could target birth control and they could also target IVF because IVF depends on fertility drugs. And so all they would have to do is decide that those fertility drugs are unsafe um, harmful and remove it from the market that way. So that's, I think, an underreported and underappreciated threat. And a challenge that we face, though, is getting the public and even maybe getting the mainstream media, which could warn the public, to take it seriously. And one way that I try to deal with this is by using, looking to see what their own words are, what the Heritage Foundation itself is saying. And so very much so, they um, came out in favor of the Alabama Supreme Court's decision that effectively banned, um, effectively gutted, made it not feasible, IVF. They said, the quote, the Alabama Supreme Court got it right. The sanctity of human life extends to children created outside the womb. That was in a tweet by the Heritage Foundation, which is the lead organizer of Project 2025. And then on the issue of birth control, they were um, they have been pretty clear about that as well. They have a tweet which I posted that said, um, "quote Conservatives have to lead the way in restoring sex to its true purpose and ending recreational sex and senseless use of birth control pills." End quote. And if you look for it, you will see that a lot of the far right influencers, perhaps with Charlie Kirk's Turning Point USA taking the lead, have begun really attacking. Um, hormonal birth control. And I'm emphasizing hormonal birth control in part because the IUD is already is expressly under fire by these people because it prevents implantation and they believe that concept that life begins at conception, which is a fertilized egg even before it implants. That's why that's why the, the Alabama courts ruling effectively eliminates IVF. Um, so the IUD prevents implantation, and to them, that's abortion. But they even will go further than the IUD to hormonal birth control, in my opinion. I think certainly there is legitimate cause for concern. So the next thing I wanted to touch on is how exactly has the Christian right managed to make so much progress in taking over our government, um, or really mostly our, our government? And this really, I think, is it's been because they've been very strategic, and this dates back largely to um, the original sort of founding of the religious right movement. Paul Weyrich is a, uh, was, it was a Christian fundamentalist leader who many consider to have been the father of what is called the conservative movement that is really the Christian right, religious right movement. And he founded a number of Christian right nonprofits. One of them is the Free Congress Foundation, which in 2001 had a manual which included the following um, statement, quote, we will not try to reform the existing institutions. We only intend to weaken them and destroy them. We will attack the very legitimacy of the left. We will use guerrilla tactics to undermine the legitimacy of the dominant regime, end quote. And so part of this guerrilla tactic strategy has been to be secretive 
And this extends even to their sort of organizational structure of the Christian right, which at the, at the top level consists of a group called the Council for National Policy. And it's an umbrella organization in a sense that literally almost every single prominent um, Christian right nonprofit, there, some leader in their organizational structure belongs to the Council for National Policy. And they meet uh, biannually and they meet in secret and their membership lists are secret. And so this has been very much a shadow network that has been um, strategically plotting to take over our government. And I use the phrase shadow network, which deliberately, that is a phrase that was coined by Ann Nelson, who is the author of the book called Shadow Network, which talks about the Council for National Policy and how in its takeover, basically, of the Republican Party. One of the ways that they have um, also achieved so much headway is through deceptive language. And this is another strategy that was promoted by Paul Weyrich, who early on said that their coalition, which at the beginning consisted of fundamentalist Catholics like Paul Weyrich and evangelical extremists, right-wing evangelicals, he said that they must package their new philosophy in, quote, non-religious language, end quote. And this is a strategy that I think has really paid off for them and that they have implemented uh, religiously. So they have used secular names for their nonprofits. For example, the Heritage Foundation, you wouldn't know from that name that it's a religious right organization. The Leadership Institute, the Alliance Defending, Free Defending Freedom is huge. They are a Christian legal advocacy organization, but nowhere in their title does it tell you that. Moms for Liberty, only recently have we really been able, I think a lot of people suspected, but only recently have we been able to show definitively that they are very much embedded with the religious right. Patriot Mobile, there's Seven Mountains organization, Patriot Academy, Concerned Women for America, um, Turning Point USA, none of those to the casual observer, to the casual voter, to the casual person in the media would tell you that those are Christian right organizations, and yet they all very much are. And this, this strategy of using secular language is also extended to their initiatives. So for example, um, school choice is what they call taking away um, public funds from public schools and redirecting it to private, often religious institutions um, and homeschooling, which is often religious as well. And that is their preference is to replace most uh, public schools with these private Christian academies and homeschooling. Um, parental rights, they chose that instead of saying that we want to, in evangel evangelical culture, we like to hit our kids for discipline and we don't want child protective services to get in the way. So that's the, that is the origin of the parental rights doctrine. It began with, um, the Homeschool Legal Defense Association and some other parental rights nonprofits, all of them tied to Michael Ferris, who is an evangelical attorney, very powerful, who served as silent co-counsel on the case that overturned Roe versus Wade. Um, and I think I'm probably getting close to running out of my time. Um, I just wanted to say one other thing that they've been very good with this sort of warfare mentality is constantly being on the attack, never on the defense. And they have plenty to be on the defense for. And in particular, sex abuse is where is really an Achilles an Achilles heel for them. I mean, it's more than an Achilles heel. It's actually a really horrifying aspect of Christian fundamentalist culture, which I think has actually um, arguably enabled a disproportionate amount of sex abuse through its um, culture in which women and children are told to submit to the authority of to male authority figures, and oftentimes victims are told that are led to think that if they're abused, perhaps they enticed their abuser. And the concept of repentance, that that's all you have to do if you're an abuser is repent and that's good enough, um, I think has maybe enabled this culture of abuse as well. And of course we have seen massive sex abuse scandals involving the Southern Baptist Convention, which is America's largest evangelical denomination and is very prominent in the Christian right. Um, obviously the Catholic church has had its many sex abuse scandals. And the Mormon church has also had so it's many sex abuse scandals. And so what they did is they managed to remarkably get away with um, accusing public secular schools of grooming and, and indoctrination um, when they've got these horrific sex abuse scandals going on in the background. And for whatever reason, the mainstream media has not done enough to call that out. And I think it's partly because the mainstream media, the political media, 
didn't see what was happening in with these sex abuse cases is as relevant to politics, but it is because oftentimes it's the same people who belong to the Southern Baptist Convention or who adhere to Catholic fundamentalism who are then accusing secular institutions of grooming and indoctrination and demonizing the LGBTQ community as groomers and indoctrinators. And so they've really, um, really had a heyday with deflection and projection. And I think that is probably over my time. So I will thank you very much. I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much, Jenny. I saw a lot of people posting in the chat your handle on Twitter so people can start following you there. And again, we will be including all of that in our follow-up. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Cyril Micheleko. I hope I said it correctly. He is the editor-in-chief at the Bucks County Beacon, which has been phenomenal in reporting on school board issues. A national issue was our Central Bucks School District that had been taken over by Moms for Liberty people. And part of Cyril's work really helped people in the community galvanize and know who was leading the effort to get the extremists out. And I'm really proud and happy that Penn Ridge and Central Bucks all up there in his area flipped both of their school boards back to common sense. And because of that, just recently, Penn Ridge School District has officially shut down the Hillsdale curriculum that was being brought in and Central Bucks has gone back to common sense and protecting LGBTQ children. And um, your vote matters, your work on the ground and being involved matters. And people like Cyril really, really matter in helping us do this. So in addition to being an editor and writer, I mean, the editor of Bucks County Beacon, he's an editor writer at Christian Right Observer Weekly, Crow, which we'll be sending you the link to that. Uh, he has over two decades of journalistic experience. He has appeared in Common Dreams, Truth Out, the Bucks County Courier Times, The Intelligencer, Upside Down World, and other publications. I'm going to, while he speaks, post in chat for you his Twitter so you can find him too. Cyril, please take it away. Thanks so much, um, Sherry. And, um, you know, thanks to Red, Wine, and Blue for one, organizing this very important event. You know, education is always a first step. Um, before taking the next ones toward organizing and mobilizing back in our home communities. Um, also honored to be included on such an amazing panel um, with Catherine, Reverend Carla, Jenny, and Kira. Um, now, while I, I actually wouldn't even put myself in the same company as them as far as expertise, um, what I am is an editor of a local publication, a local media outlet, the Bucks County Beacon, who recognized the threat of Christian nationalism as a story that I needed to learn more about that the publication needed to prioritize and that our audience in Bucks County, Pennsylvania and beyond needed to be made aware of and understand. Um, this is why I reached out to Jenny early on to become a contributing writer and to uncover and unpack these issues we've been talking about today on a regular basis. And that's why I've also interviewed folks such as Catherine um, and Fred Clarkson, Andre Gagne, Melissa Deckman and others you know, in order to shine a light on the scourge of this reactionary Christian extremist movement and to, pro to provide another resource to local readers and, and listeners. Um, you know, it's also why I reached out to Kira and Jenny to start the Crow or the Christian Right Observer Weekly so that we can continue to grow the awareness, building on the work of the folks like I mentioned and others while crediting them, of course, which not oh, it doesn't always happen, unfortunately. Um, and uh, in order to create like a curated weekly newsletter where people can identify, you know, the developing stories, the, the critical stories of these movements um, that while global likely has its tentacles in each of your communities. Um, and it also provides folks, readers with resources to dive in more beyond our brief synopsis. Now, this takes me back to the, you know, initial question of, of this whole, um, you know, um, panel, and it, it, it's why is this a threat? Uh, and part of the reason is that, that it's such a threat is that it's been working largely in the shadows because of a lack of media scrutiny. Now, that's changing, but there's still a large shortfall, and especially with local reporting. You know, so I, I was asked, like, what, what can you do? 
back home. And, you know, one thing is to engage in media activism, right? Develop relationships with local reporters and editors, help them see the connections um, we've been talking about to Christian nationalism and extremism in the communities they cover. So we were just mentioning like school boards. This provides a perfect example. Like here in Bucks County and across PA, uh, there's a group, the Independence Law Center, which is the legal arm of PA Family Institute, a right-wing Christian anti-LGBT organization, which is the state chapter of the Family Research Council, an organization, the SPLC, the Southern Poverty Law Center, is designated as a hate group. Now, the PA Family Institute a couple of years back issued a public call for students, parents, and teachers to infiltrate public schools, act as informants to report on so-called, quote, political, political, sexual, or racist ideological indoctrination in public schools for potential grassroots and legal action. And then they were actually also able to barrel their way into these public school districts through their legal arm that I just mentioned, the Independence Law Center, which helps Moms for Liberty and right-wing and Christian reactionary school boards like the ones in Central Bucks and Penridge that were thankfully just voted out. It helps these folks draft book banning and anti-LGBTQ policies and administrative regulations, often offering their services pro bono um, to stay off the radar, while also like in Central Bucks where the, the um, voted out former president uh, admitted to Reuters that she elicited their help, but didn't think it was necessary to uh, divulge that to taxpayers and parents because they weren't charging anything, right? So like one thing you can do is like create databases or like family trees of groups like this, um, you know, for like the school board relation, related issues, you can use right to know and, and, and freedom of information requests laws to seek out information if local reporters aren't doing their job. And there's multiple reasons why that might happen. Um, you know, one is ideological, two is just like they might have bad editors, three is they're, they're probably their newsrooms like in Bucks County have just been hollowed out to what they were 10, 20 years ago. But if you do that, if you if you do some of the legwork for them and, and supply these local reporters and editors this information, um, you know, there's a chance, there's a better chance that they might actually follow up. But if they if they refuse to, you can still like write letters to the editor um, or submit op-eds. Uh, or maybe even put on local events like this, local town halls, um, local um you know, local book clubs, local speeches, et cetera, local press conferences, inviting in experts um, from the local community or beyond if you can fundraise for it. And then, uh, you know, obviously to kind of like do the, the press legwork with advisory and releases um, to make sure that you get coverage for it in order to raise awareness. And then finally, um, you know, if they still refuse, um, you can reach out to myself, you know, and I'll help spread the word. And, you know, and I'm sure like someone like Jenny would as well. Or you do what we did in Bucks County, which is you start your own independent progressive media project like the Bucks County Beacon, you know, which started off with just a few people um, with myself and a few other people. And it's grown into dozens of contributors. Um, and, you know, even though we're we're still small in the grand scheme of things. We're a media outlet that punches above our weight as our work's been cited in Vanity Fair, Talking Points Memo, Wonkette, Salon, MSNBC, Daily Beans, et cetera. So what I wanna do is just kind of keep this short and then we can move on to the Q&A because I'm sure folks have like a lot of great questions for these great panelists. Um, but thank you again all for your attention and for listening and thank you, Red, Wine and Blue. Thank you, Cyril. And I love your point of letting people know that the media has been hollowed out often. Um, and as we dig deeper, even there, there's been a rash lately of some of the extremist funded groups buying up local newspapers. And we're going to start to see that. We see it already in radio and TV with Sinclair. And now they're taking over our print media. So it's going to be important that we find the independent outlets like Bucks County Beacon and help them do the work. 
So now we'd like to open it up. Um, Julie and Julie, you're still on with me too, right? We're going to open it up to Q&A. Go ahead and type your questions into the chat and then we'll channel them to our speakers and get everybody to respond. Uh, one of the first questions that came up is, is it specifically evangelicals? And then I think the person kind of answered themselves saying that they're hearing that it's more than evangelicals. Um, if someone could, you know, briefly expand on that, that'd be great. Well, the movement includes many evangelicals, but it excludes many evangelicals as well. There are a number of evangelical uh, pastors and individuals who are uh, explicitly uh, opposed to Christian nationalism. Uh, and um, the movement also includes a lot of representatives of both Protestant and non-Protestant religion. Uh, it uh, the, the leadership includes a sort of cadre of ultra conservative Catholics. Um, and the movement also uh, benefits from the rise of Pentecostalism and neo charismatic forms of religion as well. Um, the sort of idea of the seven mountains is an idea that has a lot of currency within a sector of that movement. Pentecostalism is incredibly diverse. There are a lot of Pentecostal Christians who are very committed to social justice, but um, there is a, a, a faction, you know, a, a, a rather substantial faction that is open to exploitation by uh, religious right leaders and Christian nationalist leaders. So um, they have formed a, a very, um, uh, like a growing cohort of the movement. Could someone say what the seven mountains actually are? Because that's that's been a question. Some folks know and some folks don't. I can do it. Um, so the Seven Mountains is a supposedly divine revelation and a strategy by which people who, um, far-right Christians who believe in dominionism um, can achieve dominion. And so it relates to this concept of dominionism, which is the belief that some Christian fundamentalists have, that they have a mandate from God to control all aspects of our society and culture. And what the Seven Mountains does is it is a strategic framework for achieving this goal. And it breaks society down into seven different pillars, which are business, government, family, religion, media, education, and entertainment. And it encourages people to step outside their churches and go into their communities and conquer whatever mountain sort of fits with their personality profile. Um, and so that's the seven mountains. It was popularized by a religious right leader named Lance Wallnau, who is an apostle in a worldwide dominionist movement called the New Apostolic Reformation, which the mainstream media is finally starting to talk about. Um, I first learned of it in August of 2022, and because there was a video on Twitter that had gone viral um, by another Democratic activist um, showing one of their revivals. And it was this just packed stadium, just packed in Georgia. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene was there. And there were four white men standing on a stage with a big jumbotron. And they were reciting this long decree saying, we decree that we're going to do this. And we decree that we're going to do that. And then it ended out with, we decree that we're going to take over the seven mountains. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing somewhat. But that was the gist of it. And that's when I found out from another um researcher, his name's Bruce Wilson, that that was the New Apostolic Reformation. Those were leaders in the New Apostolic Reformation, and they are sort of the, the originators of the popularity of Seven Mountains Dominionism, but it has extended beyond just the New Apostolic Reformation. It's pretty popular on the Christian right generally. There's a lot of how do we stop them, but there was also a question of are we too late to organize since they've been doing this for a minute? One, uh, Thing we have to remember is that there are more Americans to oppose the politics of conquest and division than those who do not. There are more of, of the sort of us than them. And I think we need to keep that in mind. We, we are the majority um, and we need to act like it. You know, um, they're a disproportionately mobilized minority. That's why they have the power that they do. So, you know, in a country where a substantial number of people don't turn out to vote if you can get like a very small um you know frankly radical group to vote in disproportionate numbers that's how you can control elections so it's really just a matter of of mobilization um using the power that we naturally have um uh you know most americans just 
are not on a Christian and non-Christian alike are not at all on board with this kind of radicalism. Mm -hmm. And Julie, before we go to... on, a couple of people have, I'm sorry, a couple of people in chat were asking about God and country. It is very I know, limited that was my next release. Question. Okay, well, it's on very limited release right now. And I did speak with um, Steve Oatkin, who's one of the producers. They're hoping it's going to start to spread a little bit, but they don't expect it to make a lot of money at the theater. They just want the attention. They are hoping probably by April it will be out on streaming. And at that point, we will be putting together a guide to host home viewing parties for people from Red Wine and Blue. And we will send it out to you so you can watch it on your own or invite a few friends over. And, and remember, relational organizing, which is a Red Wine and Blue thing, have your friends over, talk about what's on the line this year in the election, watch it together, we'll guide you through it. So we'll keep you as posted as fast as we know. Catherine, do you know any more about it than I do? No, that's great. Yeah. That's amazing. Right. Uh, if I could just comment quickly on the t about it being too late. I absolutely don't think it's too late. I mean, the religious right votes, they're very enthusiastic and they vote in disproportionate numbers, but we can be very, the rest of us can be very enthusiastic and do the same if we have the knowledge of what's at stake. And that's why I feel what Heritage Foundation and some of these other groups have been messaging about their views on birth control and IVF. It's out there. We, it's journalist's job to screenshot it and save it and, and warn the public. Because I personally think that if, if it is widely known that they disapprove of uh, birth control and that that might be on the chopping block, that it will turn out people in droves, like well beyond the IVF and abortion issues. Because people, unfortunately, tend to be a little bit um, self-focused and most women, or I don't know, actually, I don't, haven't looked at the statistics. A lot of women have, have used birth control and depend on it, especially if abortion is not going to be an option. And so I actually think there is an opportunity as horrifying as it is to use it though, to mobilize the vote because, um, fear unfortunately does motivate voters and, you know, you don't want to genuine, you don't want to genuine generate false fear, which is what I think that the Christian right often does, um, phony fear. But if you have a real reason to be afraid, and we do, unfortunately, I think that could drive enormous turnout. If the mainstream media will, the legacy media will get on board and start messaging this better. And it has to be more than just saying birth control is at risk. You have, they have to explain it. And I think they have to provide the exact quotes and the reasons why we know that birth control is in the crosshairs. Well, we've had folks on before that have talked about how family planning is one of our most fundamental rights, how teachers plan their pregnancies around summer break, how other people in um, other uh, kinds of professions do similar things. You know, if you work in politics, you plan for, you know, off seasons. And so, you know, that would all be denied to, you know, everyone if um, birth control is attacked. Cyril, did you want to say something really quick before I go to the next question? Sure. Yeah. Um, I would just say, like, you know, don't mourn, organize, right? And organizing works. And we've seen it happen in Bucks County, in Central Bucks School District. You know, there was a group, Advocates for Inclusive Education. Now, while they weren't, like, you know, explicitly organizing against Christian nationalism, they were pushing back against the Christian nationalist agenda to kind of, like, you know, erase the LGBTQ community from representation in schools, as well as with the book banning um, and then in Penridge, um, the Ridge Network, these were two organizations that just propped up in like the last year, two years, and they they had success, right? They flipped the school board in Central Bucks, which was Moms for Liberty dominated, and they had a mega millionaire aspiring oligarch dumping $300,000 into the campaign. They still beat them. And then in Penridge... It was it was like nine to one Republicans and Democrats. And the one Democrat was a Republican who decided the party was just too even too crazy for him. Deep red area. Now the Democrats have control. So local organizing works. And it doesn't matter that they have, you know, decades head start on us. You organize correctly or, or organize, you know, fearlessly, you will have success and you can kind of flip the situation around. And we are yeah. about relational organizing. And so as we um, go along, um, please keep track of our events. 
because we will be training on this. Um, there will be a lot of information that we will give out on this. Um, and, you know, just a, a quick definition of that, that's talking to the folks who are already in your phone, not going and knocking on doors and talking with strangers. It is far more effective, about 43 times more effective to be precise, to talk to folks that you already know versus talking to strangers. Um, someone had a question here that I did want to um, put out for them because they were really hoping that it would be answered. Um, they want to know, what are the plans for agnostics and atheists and an antithists um, in this Project 2025 or Heritage Foundation, or are they not a target yet? I'd like to answer that. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to do it by quoting something that Heather Cox Richardson wrote the other night. I don't know if you've seen the video of the right-wing activist who spoke at CPAC. The one who said, welcome to the end of democracy. We're here to overthrow it completely. Uh, we didn't get it done the first time on January 6th, but we will endeavor to get it rid of it and replace it with this right here. And he holds up a cross. And he says, well, not one nation. Uh, he says one nation under God. That's what's going to be the principle that's going to drive everything. That video clip has been going through social media um, like viral. But the thing that that's not being shown is what he said after that. After we burn that swamp to the ground, we will establish the new American Republic on its ashes and our first order of business will be righteous retribution for those who betrayed America. That sounds like a pretty big bucket. And you can use your imagination of what that is, but it's, I think that it's fair to say without, without being an alarmist that it will be a witch hunt. And I think that, that we're not just talking about ourselves and our loved ones, but we're looking at the historically oppressed that really literally will not be safe to walk down the streets. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I hope now the conversation goes to how we can start to be even more intentional and strategic. And I think that those relational conversations are going to be even more critical going forward. And so someone wanted to talk about youth. They, they, the, they asked the question, how do we get youth involved and have them understand that groups like um, TPUSA, as an example, is not a normal part of, of a political party? Some of our uh, younger voters, some of our younger folks have only ever known this kind of behavior. They, they weren't there before, like some of us here on this call, <laughs> you know, to know that this is not the norm. It comes back down to the media, mostly, um, and social media, I think. You know, I'm not personally on TikTok. I'm not sure if I should be on TikTok, but I think it can be enormously useful to mm -hmm. reaching young people. And unfortunately, I think they're getting a lot of bad content. My kids are any example um, on TikTok right now. So maybe it would be good to start countering it a little bit. I don't know. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think that problems internationally have definitely dampened um or have, have really sort of captured everyone's attention, a lot of young people away from our domestic problems. Mm -hmm. And that's why I kind of go back to the threat to reproductive rights, including birth control and that sort of thing, I think could really resonate with young people if they knew about it. We only have about um, four minutes left, but there, and there's still a couple of great questions here. Um, one, someone asked about insurance companies, aren't, shouldn't they be interested in stopping this because they're, you know, turning away women experiencing miscarriage until they're near death. Um, isn't that a liability for them? Is that, do we see any kind of, you know, anything from them? Now, I know that they're always money driven, um, but it, that I thought it was an interesting question. That is that a really is an interesting, interesting question. question. You know, there, uh, Years ago, before I published Power Worshippers, um, between my um, first my two books, I served as an investigator for the American Civil Liberties Union. They were trying to um, mount a challenge to the um, restrictions at Catholic hospitals, and they were looking not at um, abortion per se, or what you know some people think of as abortion, but uh, maternal uh, out adverse maternal outcomes. Um, women who were not able to obtain abortion to save their lives or uh, and and whose health, you know, their health was damaged. Uh, women who, you know, were were not told that their their pregnancies were endangering their lives 
women who are, you know, there are just any, any number of ways that pregnancy can go wrong. And um, the case, you know, they gather a lot of information, a lot of stories, a lot of doctors who, you know, worked in ER is saying, we turn it, we turn away a couple women a week who come in and they need DNCs and we can't give them. They're like, you, we got to, you got to go away until you're like in distress, basically until you have an infection, you know, where we can actually do it or they'll send them to different hospitals. And so they tried to do this, you know, case. And um, I think they brought it to, I believe it was the seventh circuit perhaps. And um, it was sort of the case was turned away. You know, they, they refused to hear the case. So it's it should be, you know, it should be a liability for hospitals to, you know, I think every uh, every person is entitled to best practices medicine when they go into a hospital because they're suffering some kind of health crisis. Um, and it, sh it there should be the ability to hold hospitals to account for providing best practices medicine. But unfortunately, um, uh, I've not seen a case um, succeed on that basis, but it doesn't mean, I know right now that there are a number of cases, a number of women who have suffered in Texas, um, uh, in a number of states, they're mounting lawsuits. And and so we'll just have to kind of wait and see how those turn out. I think the, 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 the more lawsuits, the more stories that come out, um, this is, you know, not something that's uh, uncommon. This is happening to women all across the country. Well, that's why I was thinking maybe a class action lawsuit um, is in order for this kind of thing to, you know, try to, you know, break this. But we are at 859. And what I want to know is if um, the four of you have like a final word, anything that you want to share. Folks who are like, oh my gosh, I'm so scared. So I need encouragement. And I think that you have given some of that with, you know, encouraging folks to organize, but, you know, just any, you know, last couple of words, um, we could start with Rev. Carla. I end almost all my videos now with stay awake, use your voice and vote. Yeah, I would say, please check out our newsletter, the um, Christian Right Observer New uh, Observer Weekly Pro, which is on um, Substack and the Bucks County Beacon as well. Um, and I think that we do try to use quotes and things as much as we can so that you can maybe share that with friends and family who are skeptical that there's really such a big threat. Educate, organize, mobilize, act, and support progressive independent media. With everything everybody said, also don't forget that a lot of politics is local, so it's really important to engage in your local community. Thank you guys so very, very much for being here tonight and sharing with us. Sherry, did you have something that you wanted to end with? Pay attention. We'll be sending the email out with all the information to wrap up of tonight and let you know when God and Country is available to stream so you can host parties with that. And um, we may end up doing a part two on this topic because it's so interesting and we would love to get Kira back and have her and maybe Anthea Butler. Um, there's just a lot of great people in the space. So thank, thank you, you all for showing up. It really matters. Mm -hmm. okay. And I just want to thank shout you. out Sherry for putting this together. She put this whole panel together. She got all the these people here for you all. So just a shout out to Sherry. So thank, thank you, you all. All right. Have a great night. Good night, everybody. Bye.